Ninoy's maiden bid for a Senate seat ran into two major obstacles. One, he would be underage, technically on election day. And two, he was not too well known outside Tarlac. Ever the creative strategist, he used both minuses to his advantage. The controversy surrounding his age made him a persistent topic of conversation and press coverage. Eventually, top-notch LP Senator Jovito Salonga, who took the cudgels for Ninoy on the age issue, won the day in the Supreme Court. At walang duda kami na yan ay pakana ni Marcos. Dahil inaasa namin si Marcos, in the 1969 election, say he will run for re-election. On the campaign trail, Aquino simply stole the show with his glib tongue and his innovative views of television and the helicopter. Using his nickname and boyish charm, he endeared himself to young voters. Echoing the Beatles, he used the campaign line, Ye, for youth, experience, and hope. Siya ang naging star dahil pagka siya'y nakita ng tao na nasa stage na naghihiyawan ng tao, kailangan namin i-bomba ang gusto namin i-bomba. And siya ang bumobomba laban kay Marco. With Aquino as Senator of the Republic, the pieces were in place for a high-stakes political chess game between two consummate masters. That he's done more harm to himself and to the country by doing this because A, he has driven away all tourists which accounts for... Ninoy's opening broadsides, exposing anomalies in the administration, unmasking the extravagance of Imelda Marcos amid massive poverty, and warning of the growing militarization of the country were just a foretaste of the titanic battle ahead. You have created an atmosphere that breeds communism. Marcos managed to get re-elected as president in 1969, but at great cost to the economy. Worsening poverty fanned the flames of student activism, a Maoist-inspired insurgency, and an Islamic secessionist movement. The pressure mounted as Marcos neared the end of his second term. His scandalous attempts to bribe delegates to the 1971 Constitutional Convention to vote for a parliamentary system that would permit him an extended term hit the front pages. I have no intention of running for a third term. Don't you think that two terms is enough for any man? In August that same year, the LP political rally in Plaza Miranda was bombed prompting the president to suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus. The stage was being set for martial law. As of the 21st of uh, this month. And when it came in September 1972, Ninoy Aquino was the first prominent personality to be arrested. With Ninoy confined to a prison cell, Marcos seemed to have gained the upper hand. But by cloaking his dictatorship with an ideology, Marcos exposed himself to contradictions that his adversary would pounce on. Marcos and Aquino both knew the weaknesses of the political and socio-economic system. And as visionaries, each in his own way, saw the need for change. Marcos chose to overhaul the system using martial law ostensibly to quell the communist and secessionist rebellions and to launch his so-called revolution from the center. And Marcos was able to redefine, reinvent the meaning as it were of constitutionalism so that the duly constituted authorities became primarily Marcos and the people immediately around him. These were the people that the military was supposed to uphold. Dismantling Congress and the free press and stifling dissent, he assumed absolute power. This allowed him to impose discipline on the populace, dispossess the oligarchs, declare a semblance of land reform, and institute centralized economic planning through a team of technocrats. At the start, Marcos's ploy seemed to work as the Philippines attained economic growth and a measure of political stability. He was doing this at the same time that he was creating deals for himself. 
assigning huge parts of the economy to himself and to his, uh, uh, his cronies. So in this case, uh, he awarded, uh, for instance, the, uh, the coconut industry to uh, Danding Cohanco, the sugar industry to uh, his friend uh, Roberto Benedicto, the uh, media to uh, people like his uh, brother-in-law. Uh, after the termination of the parity rights in 1974, and where multinationals uh, had to leave the country and could not own more than 50%, this had to be assigned to Filipinos. Iyon yung tinatawag nilang cronies. Pero cronies man yan, Filipino. Hindi foreign cronies. But in time, his cleverly veiled deception would be exposed as billions in public funds were diverted to private accounts of the Marcoses and their cronies. This would exacerbate poverty, stimulate insurgency, and drag the nation into crisis. At the same time, Marcos's repressive regime virtually silenced a whole generation of potential leaders, many of them idealistic young Filipinos in unmarked graves. By contrast, Nino Aquino envisioned change from within by empowering common folk. Confident of his grasp of information and of his skills in argumentation, he staunchly believed in the marketplace of ideas, preferring to meet dissidents in this arena rather than in the battlefield. But if one were to confront him with guns, he would not hesitate to meet violence with legitimate force. Some theorize that pushed to the wall, Ninoy could be just as ruthless as Marcos. Marcos saw himself in Ninoy and Ninoy saw himself in Marcos, that they were essentially the same political animal, so to speak. And so uh, that's why they were, they had a, somehow a mutual respect for each other and at the same time a mutual fear of what the other is capable of doing. One can only wonder how Aquino would have applied his seemingly progressive ideas had he risen to the presidency as widely expected in 1973. Instead, Ninoy found himself in prison where he drew closer to his family, his real friends, and his God. There, his political philosophy found new depth as he realized the need for selflessness and spiritual transformation as the first step toward lasting change in individuals and in society. That was also his lowest. That was the first time I saw Ninoy cry. As everybody knew, he was very ambitious and he really wanted to be president. Then suddenly he is in prison and then he realizes that all of this is really not important. I realized that all the pomp, the glory of the Senate were ephemeral. That wealth, that clothing, keeping up with the Joneses was not of this world really. And having discovered that, I have lost my appetite for power. He became to be religious, tsaka yung fatalist. If you call that a purification process, that's it. Yes, he was purified by prison. When his case finally came to trial, Ninoy refused to recognize the legitimacy of the military tribunal tasked to try his case. Why? Because President Marcos had already prejudged him. President Marcos publicly said, that Ninoy is guilty of the charges against him. As a gesture of protest, he went on a 40-day hunger strike that nearly cost him his life. I felt that uh, I've served a full life and it was time to go. But somehow on the 40th day, I was struck by that letter of Father De La Costa to me. And he said, do you think by trying to die you are being courageous? He said, you're not being courageous, you're a coward. It is more courageous to go on living. You're opting out. You're escaping. And it's an act of cowardice. To continue living and to continue fighting. He said, it's more courageous. And ultimately he said, if you believe in the divine will, do not interfere with his will. Let his will be done. 
From our point of view, there are no political prisoners. Those who are under detention are free. With the Carter administration scrutinizing Marcos's human rights record, the dictator stopped short of carrying out the death sentence meted out by the tribunal. He even allowed Ninoy to run for a Metro Manila seat in the interim Batasang Pambansa as part of the Laban ticket against the Kilusang Bagong Lipunan team led by Imelda Marcos in 1978. While the imprisoned Ninoy didn't stand a chance in the counting of the ballots, he seized every opportunity to embarrass the dictatorship and to gain sympathy for the cause of freedom and democracy. All I ask Mr. Marcos is, send me before an impartial tribunal, not a military officer. But uh, you're prejudging all this uh, military officers. But napaso na ako eh. If you attend that uh, Dogon mission, we stand up, hindi ka pa nakakatayo eh, denied ang motion mo eh. Eh siyempre mga general yan eh. Eh pag eh, nagalit si Apo sa kanila, eh diretirado na sila. But uh, sir, would you, wouldn't you think that uh, by making a statement such as that, you're really questioning the integrity of all these men? No, it is the circumstance. Ronnie, kamukha mo, empleyado ka ng NNPC, maa-attacking pa si Marcos? Ba, hindi pwede. No, no. Oh, eh, na nga eh. I will not attack the president. I have no, I have no quarrel with ba, him. Ba, hindi nga eh. Because you are also in the NNPC. You're employee. When Inoy suffered a heart attack, Marcos made another concession. He allowed his rival to go to the United States in May 1980 with his family for heart bypass surgery on condition that Ninoy would promise to be on his best behavior and return to Manila soon after recovery. Over the next three years, Marcos would maneuver back and forth, weighing whether it would be better for Ninoy to remain relatively harmless in the U.S. or to go home to face the music. The protracted political chess match had entered an inconclusive middle game. 